Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about Garrett Hardin's Lifeboat Ethics, the case against helping the poor. Uh, like Peter Singer, Hardin was also a 20th century academic. Uh, he taught human ecology at UC Santa Barbara, and he was famous for his arguments about the tragedy of the commons uh, and about overpopulation and things like that, which is precisely what we're going to be getting into today. So there are a couple opening questions I came up with for today. Uh, the first one is, how can we balance global ethical obligations with communal ethical obligation? And here's what I mean by that. So you have yourself and you have some kind of obligation to yourself. And then you have your family and the people around you in your immediate or somewhat immediate vicinity. And we'll call these people your community. So if you believe in obligations, which I'm sure most, if not all of us do, then you believe we have some kind of obligation to the people in your community. But how about the people that are in your community, but are still part of the world, right? What about people that aren't in your house, aren't in your township, aren't in your state, aren't even in your country? What about people on the other side of the world? This is where we get into the idea of global ethical obligations. And the question is, if you believe that there's some kind of global ethical obligation, or in other words, if you think that people are obligated to everyone in the world to some extent, how do those obligations interfere with the communal obligations? Um, is there a hierarchy where one is more than the other? Uh, are they equal? The trouble with saying they're equal is that there's going to be situations where you have to choose between your immediate community and the less immediate global obligation. And that's the very kind of thing we're going to be talking about today. Another similar question, how do you balance short-term ethical obligations with long-term ones? In other words, when you make a decision, there's going to be outcomes, right? This is consequentialism 101, which we've talked about. But here's the thing, outcomes change over time. So when you do something, there might be an immediate effect, but then over time, there might be a different effect that happens. And so you want to think when you act, should you act for the short term or should you act for the long term? It's not the case that these are always going to be mutually exclusive, but sometimes they have different effects and you want to try and balance uh, or decide which is more important sometimes in your decision-making process. And here's, here's one. To what extent should ecological threats factor into our moral framework? So we're talking about ecology, right? We're talking about the state of the world, uh, the environment, humans' role in these things. How do these issues change the way we think about moral dilemmas? So if you combine these opening questions, this gives you the basic uh, framework that Hardin's essay sits within. So let's look at the beginning on 602. He says, environmentalists use the metaphor of the earth as a spaceship in trying to persuade countries, industries, and people to stop wasting and polluting our natural resources. Since we all share life on this planet, they argue, no single person or institution has the right to destroy, waste, or use more than a fair share of its resources. But does everyone on the Earth have an equal right to an equal share of its resources? The spaceship metaphor can be dangerous when used by misguided idealists to justify suicidal policies for sharing our resources through uncontrolled immigration and foreign aid. In their enthusiastic but unrealistic generosity, they confuse the ethics of a spaceship with those of a lifeboat. Okay, so what's very interesting is that Hardin is going to be making an argument that is, in some sense, pro-environment, right? He's going to be making uh, an ethical argument that has to do with benefiting the environment, right? But by doing that, He's going to position himself against people who typically call themselves environmentalists. So very interesting. He's taking kind of a perhaps a non-conventional view within this category of environmentalism. Um, and the typical view that Hardin is going to push against 
is this idea that, oh, no one has the right to destroy waste or even use uh, more than a fair share of the resources of the earth, right? And that's the, the idea of the spaceship. If you want to think of, uh, if you're familiar with Star Trek at all, this idea that there's this global community, this idea that there is unlimited resources and everyone gets to use them equally. Uh, but Harden asks a very important question. Is it true that everyone has an equal right to an equal share of its resources? This might sound true when you first think about it, but a lot of things sound true when you first think about it and wind up being not true or at the very least less true the more you think about it, right? So it's not a matter of does this sound good like in general, detached from a situation. It's a matter of does the sounding good manifest in actually being good? Because remember, things aren't always as they seem. Um, you might be pushing back against this already by saying, no, no one has more of a right to anything than anyone else. But think about the trolley problem. Think about when we switched it from you choosing between saving one stranger and five strangers, and we made it you saving one really, really, really good person and five really, really bad people. If you choose uh, to save the one good person, what you're saying is that person has more of a right to live than these five uh, rapists or criminals or whatever you want to call it. So everyone at the end of the day thinks that people should be valued differently. It's just a matter of admitting that and trying to arrange the values in a way that can become useful when you're thinking about issues small or big. But let's see what Hardin has to say. Um, again, he thinks the, the people, his opponents, he doesn't think they're bad people. He thinks they're idealists. He thinks they, they're trying to do a really good thing. They're just misguided, right? They're, they're letting their, he's going to call it compassion, outweigh their rational decision-making skills because they use this compassion in a way that winds up making policies that are suicidal, right? And we'll see what he means by that, right? They confuse the ethics of a spaceship with those of a lifeboat. So you want to start thinking, how is that different? How might the ethics of a lifeboat differ from the ethics of a spaceship? He didn't get into it yet, but you can already start thinking about what a lifeboat is, right? It's this uh, relatively small thing that's supposed to save you for the time being um, from some kind of disaster that's happening, uh, but you can't always fit everything on it, right? A lifeboat is only the essentials. There's a finite supply of things. So when you're talking about lifeboats, you introduce the concept of scarcity. If something is scarce, that means there's a finite supply of it, right? There's not unlimited amounts of the thing. Right? Scarcity means there's only a certain amount of the thing and no more. And scarcity is a really important concept in the world because it gives things value. Uh, it changes the way we think about decisions with regard to that thing. So you want to start thinking, how does scarcity affect your decisions when it comes to moral dilemmas? So let's see what Hardin has to say. Um, to continue, he says, if we divide the world crudely, into rich nations and poor nations, two-thirds of them are desperately poor, and only one-third of comparatively rich, that should say, uh, with the United States the wealthiest of all. Metaphorically, each rich nation can be seen as a lifeboat full of comparatively rich people. In the ocean outside, each lifeboat swim the poor of the world, who would like to get in, or at least to share some of its wealth. What should the lifeboat passengers do? Okay, so he's painting this, this image for us. You can imagine every rich nation being like a lifeboat. And you can imagine that there are poorer people or pe people from the poorer nations outside the lifeboat swimming in the ocean. The question is, what do the people in the lifeboat do? Is there an obligation to help the people outside of the lifeboat? If there is an obligation, where does it come from and what exactly is that obligation? How strong is it? Similarly, is there an obligation to all of the people outside the lifeboat or just some of them? 
And if the answer is some, how do you decide which of them you do have an obligation to and which of you you don't? Right. So super interesting dilemma so far. We have to think about this. He says, so here we sit, say 50 people in our lifeboat. To be generous, let us assume that it has room for 10 more, making a total capacity of 60. Suppose the 50 of us in the lifeboat see 100 others swimming in the water outside, begging for admission to our boat or for handouts. We have several options. We may be tempted to try and live by the Christian ideal of being our brother's keeper, or by the Marxist ideal of to each according to his needs. Since the needs of all in the water are the same, and since they can all be seen as our brothers, we could take them all into our boat, making a total of 150 in a boat designed for 60. The boat swamps, everyone drowns, complete justice, complete catastrophe. So that's a pretty powerful line. Let's analyze this a little further. So he says, let's say we have a lifeboat and this lifeboat can fit up to 60 people. Now let's also imagine that currently there are 50 of us in the lifeboat and this represents all of us in our comparatively rich country. You might be tempted to say, we need to help everyone outside of the lifeboat, right? It's just this kind of gut reaction you have because we have this idea that we have to be our brother's keeper, right? We have to help everyone or we have to help people according to their need. And clearly those people are in need. And the idea is since everyone outside of the lifeboat swimming in the ocean has an equal need, right? They're all drowning. They all need help. Then one option is we take all of them in so that now we have 150 in a lifeboat designed for 60 because of its scarce resources. But if that happens, everyone dies. So you do what sounds to be the nice thing in the short term, but in the longer term, maybe even the not too long term, everyone dies. Complete justice, complete catastrophe. Very, very interesting question because it's like, if the thing you're doing is in the name of justice, but then it produces an outcome that winds up being obviously worse for everyone involved, was that thing ever even just in the first place? What happens when this abstract notion of justice interferes with the reality of the situation? So as the questions I came up with here, you might say, what should we do when, quote unquote, doing the right thing in this abstract sense produces a bad outcome? And I mean, this is just the question we've been asking all semester. It's like, should we make decisions in accordance with some uh, moral law that is rationally derived, or in this case, emotionally derived, right? Because it's not like the people choosing to save everyone is making a completely rational decision. It's more of an emotional one. Maybe that's okay. Maybe it's not. But the question is, what happens when that rational or immediate emotional idea interferes with the outcome of the situation, right? After the decision is made, what do you do? Do you do the thing that sounds nice on paper? Or do you do the thing that produces the best concrete result for the most amount of people or even for everyone? Um, similarly, what do you do when you have to choose between immediate small scale compassion and non immediate larger scale well being? So the idea is when you choose to save the people, without really thinking too much, what you're concerned with in that moment is the immediate result based on compassion, right? It's immediate and it's small scale. But you're not only dealing with the immediate moment, there are moments past the immediate. And so what do you do about the non-immediate, larger scale well-being moments that ensue after that initial one? It's a very interesting question to ask because it's uncomfortable. Um, most people don't want to have to deal with this situation where they're forced to choose between difficult choices. And I mean, this is kind of like the trolley problem, but a more 
let's say, closer to home example because it involves an actual thing that's happening and not just a random question about people tied down on the tracks. This is like a real thing. There's rich nations, there's poor nations. There's people that need stuff and don't have stuff, and there's people that have stuff. What do you do? It's not easy, right? Some people like to think it's very easy and there's an obviously correct answer, but what Harden is trying to outline here is that it's not as easy as you're thinking. And in fact, what he's going to argue is maybe the answer that seems wrong in the beginning winds up being the right one when you take everything into consideration. But let's see how he gets there. He says, since the lifeboat has an unused excess capacity of 10 or more passengers, we could admit just 10 more to it. But which 10 do we let in? How do we choose? Do we pick the best 10? The neediest 10? First come, first served? And what do we say to the 90 that we exclude? If we do let an extra 10 into our lifeboat, we have lost our safety factor, an engineering principle of critical importance. For example, if we don't leave room for excess capacity as a safety factor in our country's agriculture, a new plant disease or a bad change in the weather could have disastrous consequences. Okay, so option one was we let everyone in and then everyone dies. He doesn't think that's the right choice. So maybe the right choice is, okay, we don't let everyone in, but we let as many as we can fit, right? We fill ourselves to the brim and no more. So we could admit 10 more to our lifeboat. Okay, but if we acknowledge that that's another possibility, we have to then think like, oh, how do we choose the 10? Do we pick the best 10? Or in other words, the ones who show the most promise in terms of living a successful life, uh, in terms of contributing, quote unquote, to society, um, the ones who are most likely to create something that benefits everyone, or do we base it on need, like who needs it the most, or do we take all that stuff away and just say first come, first serve, or do we do it randomly, right? And once you do that, what do you say to the other people? You have to be comfortable, or well, or somewhat comfortable, comfortable enough, let's say, with the criteria you establish. And then he says, even if we do this, think about what happened. We now have no safety factor. Yeah, we could literally fit 10 more people, but when we do that, we're putting everyone in the boat at risk because now if something goes wrong, there's not enough resources to save us. Right? Because when there was just 50 of us and we had 10 blank spaces, we were giving ourselves some wiggle room. If something unexpected happened, we have a backup plan, so to speak. We could still live through the storm, right? to continue the metaphor. But the idea is, if we don't have any safety factor, then, I don't know, we might be putting ourselves in, a, in an unnecessary risk. To continue, he says... Suppose we decide to preserve our small safety factor and admit no more to our lifeboat. Our survival is then possible, although we shall have to be constantly on guard against boring part boarding parties. Sorry, that's a typo. While this last solution clearly offers the only means of survival, it is morally abhorrent to many people. Some say they feel guilty about their good luck. Well, my reply is simple. Get out and yield your place to others. This may solve the problem of the guilt-ridden person's conscience, but it does not change the ethics of the lifeboat. The needy person to whom the guilt-ridden person yields his place will not himself feel guilty about his good luck. If he did, he would not climb aboard. The net result of conscience-stricken people giving up their unjustly held seats is the elimination of that sort of conscience from the lifeboat. Okay, so the idea is, Let's say we recognize, although it seems like the nice thing to do is let people in, we're not going to do that because we, w we may wind up hurting more people by trying to do the helpful thing. This might be the right answer, and Harden's going to think it is. This is the only way you're going to survive. But it seems immoral. To some people, right? It gives them a, a bad feeling in their stomach. There's, there's something that feels wrong about it. But his point is like, that doesn't matter. It's not about these gut feelings you have. It's about what's objectively good for the people involved. 
And he says, if you feel so guilty, okay, then leave. Then get out, give your spot up, and let someone else come in. The person that comes in isn't going to feel guilty. They're, they're gracious. They wanted to get into the lifeboat. The fact that you feel bad doesn't change the facts about the lifeboat. It doesn't change the math of the situation, and it does not change the ethics of the lifeboat. You not wanting to deal with an uncomfortable situation does not make the uncomfortable situation go away. His point is, instead of trying to act like the uncomfortable situation didn't exist, instead of trying to ignore the objective facts about the situation, kind of just grit your teeth, accept it, and try to make lemonade in this situation. He says, The harsh ethics of the lifeboat become even harsher when we consider the reproductive differences between the rich nations and the poor nations. The people inside the lifeboats are doubling in number every 87 years. Those swimming around outside are doubling on average every 35 years, more than twice as fast as the rich. So remember, this isn't just a random thought experiment. This is attached to like real global issues and statistics. And so he's saying one thing you have to consider when you're thinking about the extent to which the quote-unquote richer nations should help the poor nations, either in the form of foreign aid or allowing a certain amount of immigration, is birth rate differences. The, the people in these two categories of countries don't reproduce at the same rate. And if you're trying to think about how to distribute a finite amount of resources effectively over a long period of time, you need to take birth rates into consideration. If you're not, you're just kind of ignoring something that's very important. Again, it's not going to go away just because you want it to. And he says the difference at the time he was writing this, which was in like uh, the early 70s, he says the people in the lifeboats, the people in the rich nations like the U.S., they're doubling in population about every 87 years. But the people outside, the people in the poorer countries, are doubling much faster on the average at a rate of 35 years. So I kind of made a graph here out of the numbers that he gave us. The green line is the population of, of poor countries over the years listed on the bottom, right? Over that span of years. And the numbers on the y-axis are in millions right so it's not 1400 it's like 1400 million which is not how you talk but you get the idea uh the blue line is the population of rich countries over this same span of time now if you look the population of rich countries definitely increases right it's it's below the 350 million line to start and then by the end it's much it's much higher than that um but Hardin's point is that the rate of increase is much higher, as you can see, for the poor countries. And these aren't exact numbers, right? And this graph isn't exactly accurate. It was just something I made to kind of help us out. Um, but it gets his point across. You might want to look into that. Now, on page 604, he says, The fundamental error of spaceship ethics and the sharing it requires is that it leads to what I call the tragedy of the commons. Under a system of private property, the men who own the property recognize their responsibilities to care for it, for if they don't, they will eventually suffer. A farmer, for instance, will allow no more cattle in a pasture than its carrying capacity justifies. If he overloads it, erosion will set in, weeds take over, and he loses the use of the pasture. If a pasture becomes commons open to all, the right of each to use it may or may not be matched by a corresponding responsibility to protect it. Asking everyone to use it with discretion will hardly do, for the considerate herdsman who refrains from overloading the commons suffers more than a selfish one who says his needs are greater. If everyone would restrain himself, all would be well. But it takes only one less than everyone to ruin a system of voluntary restraint. One of the major tasks of education today should be the creation of such an acute awareness of the dangers of the commons that people recognize its many varieties. 
For example, the air and water have become polluted because they are treated as a commons. Further growth in the population on per capita conversion of natural resources into pollutants will only make the problem worse. So he's talking about this, this thing that is known as the tragedy of the commons. And the tragedy of the commons says that when you have a resource that's owned by all, let's say, like the entire population, you can think of it like collective property, right? Um, you have a problem where people don't upkeep, right? People don't protect the resource as much as they would if they owned it privately. And there are a couple of reasons for this. One may be, well, hey, um, I don't really care about anyone else. I just care about myself. Uh, another issue might be, well, the other people are doing it, so I'm not going to be the sucker and not take advantage of it while other people do. Something else you might consider. Um, another way there might be a problem here is one person feels like they can't enact change or something like that. But the problem is when something is collectively owned, there's no incentive to keep the resource there in, in surplus or in quality. And this is an argument that a lot of people adopt when they're arguing for private property, right? Private property means um, one person or a small established group of people own the resource and they're allowed to charge people for it. And the idea is, yeah, they're making a profit off of it, but that profit that they want then provides an incentive for them to upkeep the resource. Because if they don't, then they lose their only method of making a profit. So the profit motive, although it sounds kind of sinister at first, again, things always seem one way but are the other way, um, winds up helping everyone in the long run because it preserves the resource and preserves the quality of the resource over time. And this incentive doesn't exist when you have open common collective property according to Hardin. So we can't just have this open uh, immigration, this unlimited foreign aid thing for the reasons he's talking about. And they have to all do with the tragedy of the commons. They have to do with birth rate too, but they have to do with the tragedy of the commons. And he uses uh, air and water as examples, right? Like as an environmentalist, he thinks that these things have become polluted. And he thinks the reason why they've become polluted is because it's treated as a commons rather than as something that's private and can be upkept by the profit motive, uh, which again sounds very, very weird because it sounds sinister. And hey, who knows if, if there's something better than that? We don't know. But Hardin's saying that would be the better alternative. And if we only increase the population further, the air and water and all the other resources uh, are going to just dry up and not be good. If you want to learn further about this idea of the tragedy of the commons, which has become a very popular idea within uh, like political economy, let's say, check out this video. It explains it pretty well. You could even just go on Google and type tragedy of the commons, look on the supplementary resources I gave you. Like You'll find a lot of stuff from a lot of different groups of people on the tragedy of the commons. Uh, so here are the questions after this reading that we're going to want to think of. Not all of them, but here's some of them. Once we acknowledge the existence of scarcity with regard to resources, how should we act? Right, Because if you think that there's an unlimited supply of something, you're going to act one way because you don't really have to care about consequences really. But once you realize that there's not an unlimited supply of something, you have to act differently. You have to act smarter. How are you going to act differently? Right? What are the, how does the criteria change exactly? How does that manifest in a policy implementation? How does that manifest in foreign relations? Should we act like scarcity doesn't exist and instead act towards some abstract moral ideal of unlimited compassion? Right? Should we kind of take a Kantian approach and say, listen, it doesn't matter about the outcome. We have to follow a moral law. Or should we be more consequentialist about it? Because it seems like Hardin certainly is. It seems like this guy is a kind of utilitarian. 
which is why at the bottom I say, what is the true utilitarian thing to do? Because clearly he's trying to save the most amount of people. He just has a solution that isn't uh, palatable upon first glance for many people. And he says, if we do decide to adopt lifeboat ethics, who do we choose to include or exclude from the lifeboat? What are those criteria? What do we have to weigh in our decision? What values are we adopting? Right? What outcomes are we considering? What are the variables involved? So here's just some of the questions you guys are left with at the end of this. Obviously, there are a bunch of other things to take into account of it. This is a super fun text precisely because of that and precisely because you get a view that's maybe a little bit opposite of Peter Singer. So that's why I like teaching these two texts together because they give you, uh, in some sense, two sides of, of the same coin. So if you have any questions after reading this and watching this and doing some research, as always, feel free to hit me up. I'm always going to be there via email to answer any questions you have. Uh, stay safe. I'll see you guys around.